Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Uh, I'm so pleased and delighted to welcome to uh, Prague, to the, uh, the Learning Society of the Czech Republic, uh, Professor Jean-Marie Lenn, uh, who just came from Berlin, uh, being on the way actually and always in this time, uh, spent uh, nearly a week in Prague, uh, just on occasion of uh, special prizes or awards uh, given at the uh, French Embassy. Uh, some of these prizes actually uh, bear also, uh, are named after uh, Professor Jean-Marie Lenn, and it uh, happens actually in two days uh, at French Embassy. So I guess, uh, uh, Introducing Professor Len is uh, something like to uh, carry owls to uh, 18th uh, and uh, especially chemists, but not uh, only chemists, uh, among members of uh, Learned Society are very uh, known what uh, uh, Jean-Marie Len actually uh, achieved and what uh, uh, important uh, role uh, has in uh, chemistry, in natural sciences, not only in chemistry, basically. So, uh, but still, uh, let me to uh, tell you that uh, Jean, uh, Jean Marie, uh, born in a family of uh, organ builder, and yeah, <laughs> Baker, originally Baker, but then uh, his hobby probably, but more than hobby was to build uh, up organs and to play, of course, organs too. And Jean-Marie inherited uh, this uh, skill and knowledge and talent, gene, genes for music. So when he was last uh, year in České Budějovice, we came to have a dinner together in a restaurant which uh, does have piano. So, and he instantly sit behind piano and playing like half an hour. So <laughs> it was, uh, everybody inside was, uh, was happy. So, and uh, growing up with music, with organ music especially, so must be really interesting, yeah, to form uh, personality. And uh, then he switched for chemistry. I never asked him if he started really like uh, uh, a boy who loves to do chemical experiments in kitchen or uh, uh, toilet room or something like this, like many of us, uh, uh, many of us did. But definitely, he graduated from University of Strasbourg, and then uh, he went also to. Uh, to, to, the, uh, to the United States and doing postdoc, postdoc or PhD study, postdoc, I guess, at Harvard University. And being back again uh, in Strasbourg and spent most of his time in Strasbourg. And he was pretty young when he got a Nobel Prize in 1987. That means it had to be 10 years even younger when he discovered uh, the, the whole new, brand new area of chemistry of, uh, uh, of uh, microcyclic uh, molecules, uh, smart molecules uh, making caves and cages and, and uh, uh, providing lots of uh, adventure for uh, adventures for chemists, so, and then uh, deserve, more than deservably uh, uh, awarded a Nobel, Nobel Prize, Prize for this uh, uh, brand new chemistry, actually. Uh, after him, the, the, the whole field started to be called uh, supramolecular chemistry. So, and uh, that's uh, one side. And the other uh, thing which I really like to mention is that he, uh, just a short time after Iron Curtain fell down here in our country, 
1994 uh, established uh, Jean Marie Lenn uh, Prize or Award uh, at, uh, and to, uh, at the French or with the French Embassy here or French uh, Institute, Institute of France. And uh, since 1994, actually, uh, been back uh, every single year, probably except two years in pandemics. And next year will be uh, already 30 years since you started <laughs> to, uh, to be back to return to Prague. And, and uh, of course, after such a long time, he became uh, a lover of Prague. So, and uh, a lover of Czech Republic, always exploring more Czech Republic, more places in Czech Republic. Last year, Brno, Budějovice, tomorrow he goes to Pardubice, a visiting chemist around the country. Yeah, uh, yeah that's uh, really, it's probably already enough what I, uh, <laughs> what I said about uh, uh, Jean Marie Lenn, and I am sure that he will uh, he will tell something more about uh, himself too. But uh, before I give microphone Jean Marie, let me also uh, welcome uh, a welcome accompanying person of Jean Marie Lenn, who, who is uh, uh, Veronica de Bord Lazar. Uh, Attaché uh, for higher education, universities, and science uh, at the uh, uh, Embassy of France here in Prague. So, and uh, <laughs> okay, Pavle, <laughs> let's. Uh, yeah, and it, it was actually for very fast. Uh, all I uh, like to say, and now asking. Jean-Marie to uh, take the floor, yeah. You have your yeah. microphone, yeah. Okay, okay. ça marche. <laughs> All right, it's very nice to be back here. I was here once before, and I admire the building, admire the people, uh, and he said, I'm in love with Prague, yeah, because of my wife also, because my wife had ancestors called Pshibram. They came from a Jewish family from the city of Pshibram, and they immigrated then to uh, Vienna. So there were two very famous scientists, Karl and Hans Pshibram. Karl Pshibram was a physicist, Hans Pshibram a biologist, and they, were, they developed science in Vienna. So uh, my wife unfortunately passed away two years ago. She never let me come to Prague alone. <laughs> she always wanted to be with me, but okay, these times are gone. But uh, it's a pleasure to be here, to be able to talk with you, to present some of our work, and to tell you how much I like Prague, I like the civilization, I like the music, and I like the science here. So, thank you, Libor, for the invitation to give a talk here, and it's my pleasure to be able to talk with you today. So, the title of my talk is Steps Towards Life. That's a big program, and then comes chemistry. So you may ask, what has chemistry to do with life? Chemistry is the basis of life. Now, in order to put that in perspective, we have to start many, many, many years ago. 13.7 billion years ago, here. 13.7 billion years ago, there was what is called the Big Bang, which led to the birth of our universe. Recent experiments showed that 
this was really a sort of Big Bang. This is the famous Wilkinson microwave uh, anisotropy probe, which established the way in which the universe started, which is now accepted by most cosmologists, the greatest one for sure. So there was a, pardon, there was a very big inflation after a transition, a quantum transition, and a very big inflation, which in 10 to the minus 36 seconds led to an increase in volume of 10 to the 78. And our universe was born. At that time, there was no chemistry. There was the age of physics. In fact, at these times here, even physics was not really there. It was just energy and heat. But physics then started, and particles formed, which are now well established, and these particles came together to make atoms. And the universe cooled down very quickly. For instance, after one second, it was already down from 10 to the 32 degree, degrees to uh, 10 to the 9 degrees, still very, very hot. Particles had formed, atoms formed, and when atoms formed, Molecules could form by binding atoms together. And then chemistry started around here. After about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, chemistry could start. There were atoms, they could make molecules, and then recombination of atoms and of molecules led to more and more and more complex molecules. So that's the age of chemistry. Now, chemistry then generated many molecules randomly, but the laws of thermodynamics tell us that some are preferred to others in terms of interactions and so on. And the new pr property, very important property appeared, which is on our planet, life on Earth. There is, for me, certainly life somewhere else in the universe, in many places. But what is important for us is, of course, our life. So at that time, biology started. Then something else happened. These living systems began more and more to become more and more complex, develop more and more in ways we don't understand yet. And something new appeared, which is thinking. That is why you are here. Huh? The Learn Society is a thinking society. And what characterizes human beings is thinking much more than living. Thinking is much more important. A bacterium is also living, but a, a bacterium is not thinking. And that is steps towards life and thought. I have represented thinking by this sculpture of Rodin, which is the thinker. That's a very famous sculpture, the thinker. And this was, is what characterizes mankind on our planet. It's quite a fantastic thing that on a planet, a piece of dust in an enormous universe, there was a two-legged animal developing thinking and un trying to understand where it comes from, where this he or she comes from. Now, we have time to look at the composition of our universe. This looks like a black slide. No, no, that's a real slide, because there is, as cosmologists tell us, 68% of dark energy, 27% of dark matter, and that means 95% of darkness. We still don't know much about it. But there is 5% of visible matter. That's us. This is the matter that matters. We are part of that. We are part of this 5% in our universe. It's quite fantastic if you think about that. Now. So, as a function of time, matter became more and more complex as information increased in matter. From divided matter, it became condensed matter, organized matter, living matter, thinking matter, and maybe even something more complex than our own thinking. But it's very difficult to imagine something more complex than the way we think. But maybe in the future, you cannot eliminate it. Science cannot say no 
cannot say it does not exist. It is perhaps possible, we just don't know. And that is the way of a way, it's a sort of a tendency of getting more and more complex. Now, we then have a question. There is a very big question we should ask, which I consider as perhaps not theoretically the most important, but in the most important in terms of understanding. That is, how does matter become complex? How is it possible to go from elementary particles to a thinking organism? And maybe there are even higher forms, more complex forms of matter, which someday in the future mankind will discover. And then on this planet, these two-legged mammal, human beings, invented something which we call science. And that is why we are here. And science, if you look at it in three main areas of science, physics deals with the laws of the universe, the basic laws on which everything depends, the basic laws which tell us how the universe was born by this infl initial inflation and then development. This is the basics. Everything depends on these physical laws. Then there is biology. These are the rules of life, not the laws. The laws are given by physics. Biology, the rules, is the way it functions. So what is chemistry doing? Chemistry has a very important mission to try to build a bridge between very general laws, those which regulate the existence of our universe, and the expression of these laws in a given entity, human beings on our planet and other beings on other planets. And how is it possible that it evolved on the basis of the physical laws, matter evolved in our universe to generate entities which were able to understand how this happened and to understand what is life, what is thinking and so on. Of course, we still have a lot to understand, which we don't know. But this is the mission of chemistry. And I find that it is very important. You had here in the uni Charles University, there was Einstein for some time. So the, of course, general relativity or Planck, quantum mechanics, quantum physics, these are very, very important things. But it is more basic even, not more important, but more basic to know how there can be an organism which is able to generate quantum physics, able to generate general relativity, to make Einstein exist. And this is sort of to say what chemistry is trying to do, to try to understand the steps going further and further and further from inanimate matter to animate matter. So the answer to that question is a very simple one. At least I formulate it in this way by self-organization. What does it mean? It means that it happened on the basis of the laws of our universe. Our universe has laws such that it will organize somewhere. Now this is something we might discuss, either scientifically or in terms of hum humanism also, human sciences. But this entity, this possibility of matter our matter, our visible matter, to lead to complex organisms is not an accident. It is, pardon, it is a cosmic imperative in my meaning. In other words, our universe is determined to generate organ order, to generate life, to generate thought, and it is not an accident. It is a driving force. Now, this chemical evolution of matter started with evolution before life existed, an evolution which was entirely of non-living matter. Molecules getting together, making more and more complex entities, generating membranes or vesicles like a soap bubble, which then would lead to a cell, and in this cell a compartment which then leads to life. So these are this is the non-living matter. And once life had appeared, we don't know yet exactly how this happened, but we will understand that in the future. 
then started Darwinian evolution, which is well known, and which is the self-organization of living matter. What I want to show by this slide is that, in fact, chemical evolution is more general than Darwinian evolution. This evolution of complex matter covers both the non-living aspect as well as the living aspect which started after life had appeared. Now, a little bit of history. If you look back in history, and as you know, there is this small country called Greece, where the very people were thinking very well, huh? the philosophers there. And let me just cite two of them. Empedocles, 2,500 years ago, proposed that what was building up matter around us were five elements, fire, air, water, and earth. And the combination of these elements led to properties. Earth and fire was dry, fire and air was hot, water and air humid, and water and earth cold. Okay, it's a beginning. Uh, it's uh, an attempt, which is far from what we know now, but it is a way to try to understand. But at the same time, almost at the same time, somebody else was thinking much more deeply about that, and that is Democritus. Democritus said that matter is made of particles which cannot be cut into smaller pieces. In Greek, that is atomos, atoms. So the terms of atoms was invented already by Democritus. And even that, as you know, in science, an idea is interesting, but has no value if it is not supported by experiments, but some proof. And it is said that Democritus was not just having an idea of atoms, but he sort of was led to that for, for instance, the following reason. If you go to the, the, the main square in Prague, with lots of people, no, many are not scientists. You take a piece of sugar, you put it in a glass of water, what happens? It dissolves. Huh? The sugar disappears in the water. If matter would not be particles, it would not be possible. You cannot mix things which are not particles. So that's a sort of way to convince people to say matter is particles with a lot of void, a lot of emptiness. And uh, it is said that this is the way Democritus was thinking. And if that's correct, then I think he's not only a great philosopher, he's also a great scientist, because it was based also on observation. Now, these elements were then, this visible matter in our universe, were progressively uh, studied. There were these bricks which formed matter were discovered. And uh, until the middle of the 19th century, there were tables made with the different kinds of elements one had found, like iron or zinc or lead or carbon and so on. And then in the middle of the 19th century, people began to ask the question, but is there something in order in these in this, uh, elements, these elements which look like uh, just, uh, just, peep, just bricks? And several people proposed solutions to that. The most famous one, the one which was leading to, uh, further ahead, was M Mitri Mendeleev, who in 1869 published what I consider as one of the most important papers in science of all times. This was this paper, which you see here, in Zeitschrift für Chemie, on the relationships. You know, many of you certainly read German, but for those who don't read German, there's the English translation, relationships between properties of the elements and atomic weight of the elements. And what uh, Mendeleev proposed is that you can organize these elements which were known at that time, put them in columns and rows, and that was a reasonable way of doing things and to organize it. And indeed, you can see this is the original picture of the classification of the bricks of our universe. You see, for instance, here, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Nowadays, it's written this is not a column, but a, a line, but it's the same. So, and so this was the original table, the original paper of uh, uh, Mendeleev. 
He even said some places something was not yet known. And so he put question marks. And he said this will be found, and it was found, of course. Nowadays, this periodic table of the elements, as it is called, is this. This is something all those of you who are scientists have seen that in the lectures, in the lecture rooms. This is the most important table for us because it tells us the bricks of our universe, visible matter in our universe. And there are no others. Now, being a scientist, it hurts me to say that because a scientist should not be dogmatic. A scientist cannot say there are no others. But here is inescapable. Why? Because it's like the series of, of numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's nothing between. And what is it here? Hydrogen, one proton in the nucleus, one electron around it. Helium, two protons, two electrons. So you just count. One, two, three, four, five, and so on. And to uranium, 92, the last of the natural ones. These elements, there's nothing you can put between them. So these are the elements which make up matter in our universe. This is for me something incredible. When I see this table, I thought I'm, uh, you, you fall down because look, at the end of our universe, billions of kilometers, miles away, the matter is the same. This is why one can say there is water on that planet because water is water and water is water everywhere. Hydrogen is hydrogen everywhere. Iron is iron everywhere. It's quite fantastic. But it's also sort of disappointing because we have the building blocks and we cannot do anything else. We have to play with these building blocks because there are no others. So can you imagine what that means? Sitting in this room, these two-legged animals, they discovered what our universe is made of. And there are no others. It hurts me because I think there should be some else, but there's none. It's unreasonable. It doesn't fit. Now, nowadays, that's the playground of chemistry, but chemistry, uh, chemists are like children. They play Lego. Huh? You know what Lego is? You put things, you get pieces, and you put them together, you make constructions. The, 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 the Lego box of chemists is the 92 elements, and the laws of physics tell you how you can combine them, and with that you can play. So it's like chess, it's like a game where there are rules, where there are pieces of the game, chess pieces, for instance, but chess is much simpler because here there are 92 pieces and there are laws which give you the way you can connect them. I think you recognize that I'm, <laughs> I'm really, every time I talk about this, I'm sort of uh, impressed by the fact that we were able to know that and we know it now. We can, in the discussion later on, cite some other things which are also quite impressive. So, the atoms are the bricks, the molecules are the houses uh, which you can build from these bricks. And that led to the development of what is called molecular chemistry, the chemistry of entities formed by connecting atoms together, making complex molecules, including the ones which you have in your body. You don't exist, otherwise you are just formed of molecules. Huh? You are a bunch of molecules but very complicated ones. But we are all just molecules. We can come back to that here also. There's also some philosophical ideas, metaphysical behind that. So, uh, and, and, and now chemists, for those chemists here, this is of course very well known. The linkage between the atoms is called a covalent linkage, it's a very strong bond. The these atoms stick together. And so molecular chemistry started, and if I give you just two milestones on molecular chemistry, we can consider that the start was, and most of the chemists accept that, was the, the preparation in the laboratory of urea from ammonium cyanate. Now, by Friedrich Wöhler in 1828. Uh, ammonium cyanate, don't worry about the name, it's a compound 
which exists in non-living matter, which is an, a non-living one. I mean, it's not part of living matter. Urea is part of living matter. It's in urine. Huh? You all have, uh, ure have uh, uh, urea in your body. At that time, of, um, uh, of, uh, when uh, this was synthesized by Wöhler, it, people were thinking that you could not make anything contained in a living organism without the help of a magic force. This magic force was called the vital force. So people were considered that life was something so special that it's not possible to make it in the laboratory or the, the molecules making up a living system. Well, by synthesizing, by producing urea in a way which had nothing to do with a living organism showed that there was no vital force. It was just the way matter organized itself. And he, he was very conscious of that because it, at that time he wrote a famous letter to Berzelius in Sweden telling him I was able to make urea from ammonium cyanate without the help of any animal being dog or human. So he was very conscious of that imp importance. Now, 150 years later, just to give an example, it was possible to prepare in the laboratory a much more complicated molecule than urea. You see, urea is very simple. It has just two nitrogens, two, four hydrogens, a carbon and an oxygen, very simple molecule. Vitamin B12 is a very complex molecules, molecule, and it took the efforts of two groups collaborating across the Atlantic, Robert Burns Woodward at Harvard, Albert Eschenmoser at the ETH, the Polytechnic School in Zurich, helped by, of course, many collaborators. I was one of them. I worked with Woodward. This is, pardon, this is my piece here. I don't want to say that it's my piece, but just to say that when you are a scientist, I would like to illustrate this, especially when there are many young students around, to tell them, if you, do, if you are a scientist, you are part of an enormous construction, which is understanding the world, constructing it. And so with this, this is, gives you the idea that we are together, we work together, we build up that enormous construction, which we call science. So vitamin B12 is, of course, very, very complicated compared to urea. But molecular chemistry did not stop at that stage. This was in the 1970s, and uh, so many, many uh, new developments occurred since then, making new molecules, new materials, new drugs, and so on. But then we can ask a question, is there something else we should be thinking of? And this can be illustrated in the following way. What you, hear, what you see here is this blue sphere, which is a cancer cell. A, a cell which has degenerated, so to say, has become cancerous. And here, you have two killer cells, which are attached to the cancer cell, and which will try to destroy it because these killer cells are part of our immune system and they uh, have a mission which is to find what is gone wrong and if they find this, they destroy it. This is what they should do. They should not make a mistake because if they destroy a healthy cell, no good. If they do not destroy, uh, destroy a cancer cell, no good. So there has to be something which tells this cancer cell, so, but let's say which tells the killer cells that the other one is a cancer cell, and then they can start the mechanisms for destroying the cancer cell. All these, these bodies here, these cells we have in our body, are made of molecules, like a soap bubble, huh? the spherical soap bubble. Soap bubble is a spherical, and uh, in these membranes which form the soap bubble, which form here the cells, there are molecules which sort of express on the surface the nature of what is inside the bubble, inside the cell. And that's the way in which the killer cells, by touching the cancer cells, 
recognize that this is a cancer cell and I now have to destroy it. The same is true, for instance, for also a virus. Now, uh, this is the HIV virus in blue, the blue particles. When the virus hits a red blood cell, a uh, white blood cell, sorry, then it has reached its goal, it can infect. And we have recently had problems with the virus. Uh, you know, all that, all of us have been, have been affected by uh, this virus. And the virus is an entity which is not even living, it's just a bunch of molecules, but which can invade a living organism and then uh, infect it. Now, what is going on here? What tells the killer cells that the other one is a cancer cell? What tells the virus that it has reached its goal and can now infect? Something must happen between these bodies. And the something is that beyond single isolated molecules, there is something which you may call not molecular chemistry, but supramolecular chemistry, which deals with assemblies. The question is not isolated molecules now, but it's assemblies, populations, the way in which things interact. And of course, the interaction, uh, uh, a set of molecules in interaction, that is something totally different because it goes one step further and it leads to the idea that there must be a chemistry to be developed which is not dealing with isolated molecules but with assemblies, populations of molecules. And maybe I see it already here because usually I see that in the, I see, uh, I talk about in the question session but I can already tell you the easiest way to understand the difference between molecular chemistry and supramolecular chemistry, which is our field of activity, is the following. And I, you have here bottles with water. Huh? Water can boil, water can freeze. A single molecule of water cannot boil and cannot freeze. What's the difference? The difference is that the many molecules in liquid water, they interact. And this interaction generates features which don't exist on the level of a single molecule. These interactions, they lead to the possibility of having a melting point, of having a boiling point, of having an index of refraction, and so on. So the simple fact that you put things together, but they interact, leads then to these new properties which don't exist at the level of a single isolated molecule. So, the three main properties which were studied over the years, we started this area in 1965, 66, and uh, so molecular recognition is the most basic property. Let's try to understand what is molecular recognition. Molecular recognition is based on interaction between entities. As I said, this example with water, molecular recognition is what happens between what a killer cell uh, does when it, re when it finds, when it interacts with the cancer cell, recognition between these objects. So, first you need an energy, a binding. They have to stick together. If not, if they don't interact, then you, they ignore each other. But that is not the only important thing. The next important thing, which is a property which supramolecular chemistry brought, really, I must say, this is probably the most important thing. Supramolecular chemistry brought to chemistry. That is information. You cannot have molecules recognizing one another. You cannot have cells recognizing another cell without an information. So matter is informed. Matter has the property of containing information and processing this information by the way they get together, the way they touch. And one can consider it as a sort of a, to simplify, I keep going things very simple, a double complementarity in geometry and in interaction. As you know, plus attracts minus, plus repels plus, and so on. And so this kind of uh, processes, which are physical, uh, and then the geometry is the, the fitting together. And this was already said many years ago, not in the same terms, 
because that person, Emil Fischer, and the chemist here and the biologist know Emil Fischer certainly, is a very important person in organic chemistry and also in biological chemistry. Uh, Emil Fischer wrote a very famous paper in 1894 where he studied the way in which an enzyme acts on its substrate in our body, for instance, and he said that this is only possible if they fit together we Schloss und Schlüssel, like a lock and a key. This fitting together was a basic idea of also, let's say, information in as much as when you want to open the door, you have to have the right key. Your key has to have the information to be able to open the lock. It's information also. And then you can open the door. So not only is there recognition, but also a function which comes beyond that. Let me stress also that this is Emil, who got his doctorate at our university at a time where we were not French, but the German, the German Empire. And uh, these were times which are now gone, we hope, and now we're all Europeans. Unfortunately, something I did not think would ever happen again in my lifetime, having gained a war in Europe. It's quite incredible, huh? Impossible to imagine. I still don't realize that we have a war. Huh? I thought, oh, this was finished. That's the past. Unfortunately not, but we are Europeans. The Czech Republic is part of Europe, like the French Republic, and so on. And now we have to stick together. We have to have common values. You have to stick together and try to defend these common values. Now, what is the best example and at the same time the simplest example of this storage of information and processing? It's obviously the genome of living organisms. And again here, of course, many of you know that for sure. But if you just reflect on it, it's something quite interesting to just sort of think about it. The genome which defines a given organism is information which is in a string of letters which are just four letters. These four letters have received name. They are this chemical group here, which is much simpler than vitamin B12. This is a letter called adenine. These are just, just uh, let's say, common names given by chemists. They could have been called totally differently. But the important thing is, this group, this group, this and this, are simple molecules which form the basis of an alphabet with only four, uh, only four letters in this alphabet. Is, uh, and the, the combination of this in a very long strand, these are, they are linked, they are sitting on a long strand, a sort of a long molecular strand, and it's a sequence of letters which determines whether it defines a tomato or an elephant. It's just a sequence of four letters, which contains information. This is, these are the letters for a tomato, these are the letters for a dog, these are the letters for an elephant. And uh, four, why four? This also looks so uh, incredibly simple, probably because it's enough. And you will see, I come back to that just now in a moment, because when we have the letters, we have also to have a this is a way to store the information, but then we have also to try to understand how you can process, read and process the information, and that happens in a very simple way. Just the letters can be paired up, four letters, they can make two pairs, and one pair has contacts between the letters, two contacts, and the other pair has three contacts. So it's just a binary system. Like in a computer, it's 0, 1, 0, 1. Here it's 2, 3, 2, 3. So the biological information, the alphabet of biology, is extremely simple. Four letters and two ways of putting them together. And that's enough. Now you may say, sure, why, why not more complicated? Probably in the course of evolution, other letters have been tried but it's very chaotic then. It gets probably very difficult to store the information and then to read it. And possibly it was 
so complex that the, this attempt to make more complicated um, or more complicated systems, let's say with six letters and three ways of combining and all that, that was too much, led to too much, uh, many errors, even with what we have in our body, that means four letters and two ways of getting together, is so complicated and mistakes are made. And in our organism, there are enzymes which repair, which have to repair. When there's a mutation, a change in letters, then the enzymes have to to cleave, take out the wrong letter and put in the right letter. So it's also a correction process. Now, uh, so when uh, looking at this and sort of asking the question a la Fischer, Emil Fischer, that um, we, uh, uh, we, we can consider that we have keys, we have locks, we can try to build keys for locks or locks for keys. So this is just a representation where you have here three keys, one lock, and of course the red key fits. And this was then studied in many, many groups in the last 50, 60 years, many groups around the world to try to understand. And uh, also because uh, we are depending on it. Huh? If uh, in our body there is a wrong letter introduced by an enzyme, we have a big problem. And this is the case of genetic diseases, for instance where it's a wrong letter and then, uh, okay, you have to try to change it or you have it and then you have, can be, be uh, subject to given disease and so on. So, if we conclude at this time, first step, conclusion, we are not finished yet, don't worry. <laughs> uh, chemistry is usually considered as the science which deals with the structure and transformation of matter. What is, what it is, how it is built up, and how you can convert chemical entities into one another. But we have now seen that there is another property which is as important, but which is intrinsic, which is that it is also an information science. It's a science of informed matter. DNA, the double helix, is a molecule, like all our molecules in our body, which by their shape, by their composition, by their architecture, so to say, uh, uh, define an information. And the way they interact, this is the way this information can be processed. So the storage is at the molecular level, the molecule itself, and the processing is at the supramolecular level. They have to get together, to touch each other. So this would be a molecule, and this would be the interaction. So it's molecular, and then the level is supramolecular. So chemistry, as molecular chemistry, was defined in 1828 by Wöhler, and then trying to use these ideas of molecular chemistry and trying to understand what happens when molecules get together led to supramolecular chemistry in 1978. It's the first time uh, I used that name that word, and so uh, these are then supramolecules, and you have the three main processes which were studied, how molecules recognize one another, how they can uh, uh, interact and uh, process, transform one another by reaction, or how they can carry inside the cell. Now, these are two things I haven't talked about, the second, the, um, the transformation and uh, the uh, transport, because this is just uh, other aspects. But for instance, in a cell, a living cell, you have to control what goes in and out. And this is transport processes where they are in our cells, in our body, uh, like many of you probably know, uh, they have, one, have to, one has to control what goes in and what goes out, just to keep the cell living. So. These are function systems, and of course, then these processes have studied, been studied in detail in many laboratories around the world. Now, some applications. Let me just summarize that, so of course, there are many possible applications. The first one I would like to mention is just this question of molecular recognition. It's also uh, very fundamental in drug discovery, because uh, one can say that a drug which you buy in a pharmacy is a key 
for a molecular biological lock. And of course, you want to make drugs which are as good keys as possible. That means when I mean good, just fitting one type of molecule in the body and not other ones, so as not to have side effects. When the key is not good enough, then you can have side effects. But if the key is very good, very selective, going only for one molecule, the more it is that way, the less side effects you have. This is, of course, summarizing things, but just to sort of, uh, make it clear. Now, um, we also developed, and just to give you an idea about some applications, which uh, there are many others, but uh, for instance, we also made molecules which had in the center a europium ion that is one of the elements in the periodic table. When you put it into a, into a cavity, which makes a good shell around, then it begins to fluoresce and have a red color. And so this has been used to, make, uh, to develop a technology for medical diagnostics where you uh, can label proteins, the molecules in organisms, with this one and then use it for medical diagnostics. And it's used, this machine has been developed by Gérard Matisse and the company, and this is now used in hospitals. Then there is the question of transport. How do you selectively control what goes in and out of a cell? This is very important also, especially if you want to interfere with this uh, question of uh, introducing genes into a cell. And uh, on one hand, I know this, uh, this can then lead to gene transfer for gene therapy, but also for biotechnology. Now that is an important point because many people are afraid of genetically modified organisms. You should not be afraid. Genetically modified organisms, we know how to modify them. We have just to do the right things, the right modifications. And for instance, there are uh, um, diseases like the bubble children, the bubble, no, let's be concerned. Like uh, cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a disease where in the lungs of children, there is a, a, a channel, a transport channel, which goes through the membrane of the, of the lung cells, and which doesn't function well, because it's a, it's a, a chloride, a channel which exchanges chloride ions. And uh, so this can be, at least there are many attempts, trying to correct that by introducing the correct gene and making this function again. Uh, the other uh, appli possible applications is to uh, use this uh, um, type of approach for making genetically modified organisms. Uh, I know many people don't like it, but I am convinced we will use it, and in the future there will be many genetically modified organisms. For instance, if temperatures go up, we need plants which resist heat and which use less water. I mean, can do that. Another example, we are in time now where there are flowers everywhere. Trees have again leaves and all that. It looks very efficient. That's photosynthesis does that. But it's very inefficient, in fact. Natural photosynthesis is very inefficient in terms of energy. Most of the energy is used just to cool down the plant by evaporating water. So uh, it is important to also try to improve natural photosynthesis and uh, to uh, try to, for instance, the fixation, everybody talks about CO2 these days, of course. The fixation of CO2 in plants is very inefficient and it's very important. So many people have been working for many years already trying to improve the, or the enzymes which do that job and only quite recently has it been a, a young group in Germany uh, and a number of people are working on it to try to improve what is called carboxylation, taking CO2 and using it up in plants. To, if, we, if you can, the, the yield right now is about 5 or 6%. If you can do it 10% better, 10 times better, of course, that's fantastic then your plants would grow much faster, it would fix much more CO2. We are not there, but it's a, one, a, very interesting, um, a very interesting direction. Let me also show you something about biomaterials. 
So what is a, a supermolecular material? It would be a material where the important thing is the way in which molecules fit together. And let me show you what, what was the result, which he did not predict. It's also an illustration of the fact that basic research is absolutely necessary because you do not know where it will lead you from the start. And let me just show you a thing. Uh, there is a class of polymers. Polymers are plastic materials. Huh? where usually the links between the bricks are covalent bonds. But in the supramolecular materials, the interactions are of supramolecular nature, the, this non-covalent ones. So we, we, in 1990, we published a paper on that, which introduced the field. And then many people, chemists, worked on it, which is open the case of science. In science, there is a discovery made, and then, then there are more and more development, and so on. And, and then in 2013, I got a message from a small company, Xeltis, in the Netherlands, which said we have made supramolecular materials which are biocompatible, don't biomaterials, and we have made out of it plastics, so to say, which can be used for surgery of children who had a cardiac malformation. Now, you will say, who and when has it been done? It was the 23rd of October, 2013, and here is the first child, a girl, Dominica, four-year-old, which was implanted with this, one of those supramolecular polymers by Professor Leo Bukheria in uh, the Bakulev Center for Cardiovascular Surgery in Moscow on October 23rd, 2013. And she's fine. She still is fine now. She's, of course, 10 years older and uh, fine. And many more children have been implanted. So uh, that's also something where when we developed initially in 1990, when we published the first paper on supramolecular polymers, we had no idea that one could make out of this type of polymers biomaterials, which then would be used for instance, for the um, cardiac reconstruction of children who had a heart defect. You can, they, the same people, they made also then uh, heart valves, uh, pulmonary valves, in which have been studied in Budapest, in Krakow, and in Kuala Lumpur, and some other places probably also. I, don't have, I haven't followed everything. So they say that's a breakthrough in surgical practice, to have a new material which can be used to repair organs. And uh, so, of course, when you spend your life on trying to make, let's say, uh, basic discoveries, you also can see that sounds so many intelligent and clever people around the world that somebody will find an application of interest. Uh, another property of interest, if you make a film, like a plastic film, uh, I don't have anyone here, but a plastic film of supermolecular uh, polymers, you cut it in two with scissors, you cut it here, then you superimpose the two ends and you press with your finger, for instance, huh? this. Then it sticks together. You can stretch. It sticks. It's repaired. So these are films which you can cut. You put them on top of each other and they stick together. They repair. So these are self-healing type of materials. Now let's go back to the main theme, which is the Supermolecular chemistry, once you understand it better, the next step would be to understand how to control what's going on. And uh, this would be then, can we can make systems which self-organize? Like we are self-organized. We as, uh, as living organisms are self-organized. Why we don't put ourselves together? We develop and we generate a human being. Uh, pardon. And so, uh, can one, in the laboratory, and this has been done in many places, can one try to develop systems which will automatically, just on the basis of the way in which the bricks are designed, generate given architectures on design? 
A good example for that are viruses. Now, all of you now, we are, you are, I can, everybody now knows about viruses because of the pandemic. Uh, that is exactly what happens. When uh, a virus wants to enter into a cell, it has to recognize the cell and then have a mechanism to get in. Now, the simplest, one of the simplest viruses which has been studied of, uh, the, uh, over the years is the tobacco mosaic virus. And this tobacco mosaic virus uh, has, is built up of 2,130 bricks, which are these uh, protein subunits, these bricks here. This, they, they bind, due to their shape and the way they, they orient, they can link together and then they make a sort of a tower, helical tower, and this is spontaneous because the molecules contain on the surface the right molecular information which makes them stick together a given way. Not this way, but this way. And this is just a question of what are the interactions and how they are put together. Pardon. So, uh, one example I would like to illustrate is just to give you an idea, is to have organic molecules, which are the bricks, and metal ions like iron or zinc or cobalt, which are the cementing units, the winds, which brings them together. And doing that, one can then generate, for instance, artificial double helices and triple helices. Just, this was just for fun. Uh, we wanted to see if we can do it, and it works quite well. Then we can make grids, molecules, which are, for instance, in that case, three and three, they are like that together, and at each intersection there is a middle line which holds them together. Then you can make also circular type of entities, and you can also make cylinders where you have rigid molecules, which are long, and you have also then flat molecules, and we have the middle ions which hold them together, and just to give you an idea, for instance, with this last case here, there are three uh, molecules which are linear, there are four flat ones, there are 12 metal ions which hold them together, and you just have to mix it and it builds up automatically. Right, but just, it's just physical properties, the way in which the molecules are constructed, the shapes, the way they get together and they hold held together. And it's nothing magic, it looks like magic, but it is not magic at all, it's just on the basis of the way in which things are constructed. And of course that can be interesting for nanoscience and nanotechnology because we have here these nice computers, you know, these, the computers, they are complicated objects which you have to fabricate. And in fact you could say, all right, why not try to build up, to, why not make a system which will automatically generate a computer from its pieces? Now, okay, you say, this is just dreaming. Well, it's not so much dreaming because we, we know it exists. Our brain, what we have between our two ears, that's the best computer in the world up to now. And you don't make it, it makes itself. Huh? It's very complicated, huh? but it makes itself. There's no need to build it up. So, so this first step, let me just show you where we are going now, but very simply, just because it's already quite long. So, what I showed you up to now is to design the bricks and to put in the information and let it go, and you then generate functional entities which have given properties, more or less well, depending on how you construct your pieces, your bricks. But then you can also think that maybe there's another process which is the step, the next step in complexity, which is to let the system choose what it needs. For instance, if you have uh, many different bricks, the system from these bricks can pick out the ones it needs to construct itself. And this is now an, uh, an area which we are developing, where uh, you need diversity, many different bricks, Dynamics, they have to stick together, but not too strongly, because if they stick together too strongly, they may be making a mistake. So they have to separate and recombine afterwards. And this gives then uh, what we call a dynamic chemistry. That means a chemistry which is uh, based on dissociation or reassociation of the objects, uh, which then is possible, then because it can dissociate and reassociate, it can also 
reassociate differently if the conditions change, and then, of course, you have the possibility to change, to respond to changes in the environment, and then to have a lead to what we now call adaptive chemistry. This is the area which we are now developing since about 10, 12 years. Okay, uh, so uh, let me just say that this way of looking at things on this dynamic chemistry where the chemical object can separate into pieces and reassociate, but maybe differently, this is something which then opens also to, uh, uh, to an adaptation, the fact that when conditions change, there's a response and the object can change. Now, I could illustrate that by chemical examples, but I wanted just to tell you the concept of uh, what is going on there. So it's an adaptive chemistry. Now, uh, so evolution of chemistry, we start with molecular, from atoms we make molecules. Then when molecules get together, we get supramolecular entities where the interaction between the bricks, the molecules, is important. Then it can get organized, depending on how it is designed. Dynamic, if things can, they can separate, reassociate, maybe differently, in order to respond to changes in the environment. And then it can become adaptive. And of course, life is an adaptive system. Living systems, they can adapt. Sometimes that is very good. Sometimes it's a problem. For instance, a cancer tumor, if you treat it with a chem chemotherapeutic agent, they can adapt. And after some time, they are not sensitive anymore to the chemotherapy. So that's a problem. Huh? There's an adaptation to an enemy. The enemy is the molecule which is made for, uh, as a chemotherapeutic agent. And then uh, the tumor can escape. So, just uh, to summarize, then, I hope I have convinced you that the essence of chemistry is also to create new forms of matter, which don't exist yet. Nature has created us and, and many, many other living organisms and so on, but nature hasn't made everything which is possible to make. It just made what is the cause of evolution was developing. So one can say that the book of chemistry has to be written, not only to be read. Of course, when you look at the tree, you have to try to understand what that tree is, how it functions. When you look at a human being, for us it's important to understand how we function. Just for instance, in the simplest way to say, to try to combat, to uh, be able to uh, find drugs to resist a given disease. But there are others which are not yet done, and for instance, and drugs are usually most, no, many of them are by uh, natural molecules, but also many which are not. Pardon, I pushed the wrong button. And like the score of chemistry, and in a town, a musical town like Prague, the score of chemistry, you have to write it, not just to play it. So chemistry is a, has a creative power. You can see chemistry is the art of matter. Now, this kind of things has been said already 500 years ago by somebody everybody knows, of course, Leonardo da Vinci. He wrote a fantastic sentence, which I, for those who speak Italian, you read the top. The others I have translated into English. Where nature finishes to produce its own species. We are part of that, huh? Evolution, natural evolution has produced human beings. Okay, that's fine. Man begins using natural things. What are the natural things? The periodic table of the elements, the bricks, which make up these 92 bricks, which make up matter, visible matter in our universe. In harmony with this very nature. Okay, this harmony is a nice word, but what we know about that is it's just laws of physics. Huh? You can, these things have to be put together following rules which are, which are given which are determined by physical laws. And then comes the end, and the end is very strong. You know, uh, Leonardo da Vinci was a scientist, an engineer, and of course an artist. So for an artist, creating is something very profound. And he said, to create an infinity of species. 
This is already genetic modifications, if I may say. I don't think Leonardo had any idea that someday one could do genetic modifications, but to create an infinity of species means you can modify what nature has produced. And when you modify something produced by nature, it's just natural too, because we are a product of nature, and therefore what we do is a product just amplified by what I, we can do. So it's not just a question of limiting ourselves to what is so-called natural, but also inventing everything that is not done yet. So here we go back to Greece. That's Prometheus. And you know that Prometheus, he stole the fire of knowledge from the gods. And here you see him running away with uh, the fire in his hand, looking over his shoulder to see if the other people don't run after him to try to catch him so he cannot give it to mankind. But they couldn't, they didn't catch him. And so uh, Prometheus gave the fire of knowledge to mankind. And here he has this fire of knowledge. Now, this is science, but there is a consequence. The consequence is we cannot give it back. What you know, you know. Knowledge, you cannot just erase it. Once you have it, you have it. And we have to learn how to live with it. We have to learn how to use it for the, what you might call the good, which is how we behave, how we can survive, and so on. And you can say that the path of our evolution leads us from trying to get knowledge to understand to the control of our destiny. Now our destiny is in our own hands. The future of human evolution is in our hands. For the moment, okay, not too quick, not too fast, because we have to determine also what we want to do but it is in our hands. And uh, the examples, uh, one can have many examples here. For instance, when you have a cataract, you get new lenses in your eyes. These are not new lenses. This is an artificial plastic. If you, at a certain age, you may have a replacement in your hip, titanium. This is not that, this is not natural, so to say. And if I want to push the point, if you get a heart transplant, you cannot say to your wife, I give you my heart. It's not your heart. It's a pump. Of course, I understand very well, you all understand that giving the heart is also something which is uh, emotional, which is affective, which is psychological. But nevertheless, we have already transformed ourselves. Many people around the streets are not natural. They have titanium, another plastic. They may have implants in their teeth and so on. And we will continue doing that. The real question is how and what. That is not simple. But when we know, we can, and then we have to decide what we want to do. So I have not said much about mathematics, expect, except one, two, three, four, five, up to 92. So let's say something about just mathematics. There's a very famous mathematician. There are probably mathematicians in the, in the room. They know David, David Hilbert. And he wanted, on his tombstone, he wanted two sentences, which he had given. I think he had given a talk on that. The first sentence is, wir müssen wissen, we must know. That is something, you know, like driving. We must know, we must know. The second part is even stronger. We werden wissen, we will know. Now that is a vote of confidence. <laughs> because, okay, if it pushes you to know, if you are sure you will not know, then you are quite discouraged. But this uh, drive to this conviction, this fact that we will no, we were than wissen is something very strong, and I think which pushes scientists ahead. So here is again the role Prometheus showing knowledge and science to gather it, to the quest of knowledge, 
And of course, this is not for you. Most of you are scientists or uh, are advanced in knowledge. This is for the young students to tell them the future of humanity depends on how we can handle things, how we can, what we can imagine, what we can control. Unfortunately, we are still dependent very much on our old brain, the paleo brain, not only the frontal lobes. And again, with the events in recent years, on one hand, the virus has been overloaded. The virus has been contained thanks to what biologists have done. On the other hand, we still have wars going on. And that is something we should really try to be able maybe to control better. So another aspect of science, and that's my last slide, so, is that that's a small planet. This is a piece of dust, nothing, and it's nothing in the enormous universe. But on this planet, there are two-legged living entities and thinking, of course, entities, which were, who were able to understand. Thinking is really what makes us, and thinking, science, has no borders. It's the, I would say, the only human activity which is valid everywhere. I mean by that, that on the planet Earth, or millions of kilometers, billions of kilometers away, it is valid. It is quite incredible, but that's the way it is. There is no frontiers, there are no dogmas, there are no flags, there are no wars. It is just valid. That's the way our universe functions. That's what is our mission also to try to understand better and better and maybe to use it for the good. Thank you very much. Jean-Marie, thank you so, so much for, such a, uh, for taking us uh, uh, for such exciting trip to wonderland of creative chemistry. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Was, You're most uh, welcome. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it was Merci just madame. gorgeous. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, uh, time is uh, getting yeah. Yeah, no, a I've little bit out to be long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it uh, doesn't matter except uh, Jean Marie has uh, another program for this night, I guess. So, but uh, anyway, yeah, if, I can if, tell you. If you have any... <laughs> when you are in Prague, there is one thing you always remember, that Mozart created <laughs> Don Giovanni in Prague, at the theatre which still exists. And this evening they give Don Giovanni. It's, it's, I have been there already four times, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah, always yeah. something Of course, I would... Uh, fantastic. Uh, yeah. I, I would like to invite you for, for uh, the next uh, room to have some, uh, uh, some refreshment there, snacks and uh, wine also. But before that, uh, is there any acute question? Yeah, please. <laughs> Thank you for your wonderful lecture. There are many definitions of life. Which one do you prefer? Um. Difficult That's question. a very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Schrodinger has written a famous book, What is Life? Yes, what yes. is Leben? And uh, okay. Uh, or Tegmark recently. It's, pardon? Uh, Tegmark, very recently he wrote a yes, book, uh, yes. Life uh, 3 So zero, it's uh, life, obviously, it's difficult because we, we have a tendency to look at ourselves when we think about what is life. But a living, uh, a living microbe, a bacterium, is also living. So that is much, much, much simpler. 
So if you, went to, if you look at the bacterium, you, have, you need bricks. You need the way they get, where they get together, that's recognition between the bricks. Then you need um, a metabolism growing, and uh, you need reproduction, transferring the information. So this is the, let's say the basic elements which are, the, let's say, the, the, um, uh, the limit, the smallest limit of life, where the smallest expression having just these properties. But of course, uh, bacterium is something very simple compared to human being. And again, as I, I sort of said, that's that uh, living is of course very complicated, but thinking is even much more complicated. And what defines us is the thinking. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, so uh, any other question, please? Yeah, easy. Is the, the essence of thinking. Do you follow these things which Pedro's very famous physicist, also Nobel Prize winner, winner suggests, you know, this is quantum collapse of, uh, of wave function in our brains, etc. It is very strange, very suspicious, but still, I think it's very ingenious. But I have more, I think it's, it's, uh, the origin of thinking is very complicated question, and you probably will just agree. But you know, I, I mean, have a, sorry, I have a personal question then. Are you a reductionist? A reductionist? Yes. No, I'm emergenist. Let's say, I would say that, uh, all right, reductionist, that means we are made of atoms. There's no doubt about that. Yes. But uh, this is what I said with this water at the beginning. Huh? A molecule of water and a glass of water, you cannot reduce the glass of water to the molecule. No, but the, the behavior of the glass of water with molecules can yeah. be reduced to basic laws. So it's, uh, let's say it's an emergence of more complex systems. Sure, but, but they are able to be reduced to the basic physical laws. You know, uh, in no, fact, no, you, you, no, had, I, you, you had fascinating so. examples in chemistry, but is it not so with proton, with quarks, with gluons which connect together proton? With what? With? with quarks which actually form proton and gluons which uh, represent yes. interaction between the things. And there is a more and more complex structure, but it still can be reduced to some basic laws of physics. Yeah, but uh, you are right in that. So but is there a new law which appears here if you go up, up in the structure? But let me just put it another way. The bricks which make up this building yeah. <laughs> do not necessarily contain what you, you can use these bricks for making different things. So the emergence, the, the bricks are the reduction of the, the building to bricks. Yeah, yeah. But, it, the, the, it, but you can make different ones. So that the, what emerges from these bricks is depending on how they fit together. Sure. But there's no other basic laws of physics or of, even of chemistry. How you no, it's just a recombination. Uh, no, it's, no, wh what I want to say is that a reductionist implies often that the elements contain already the properties which come later, whereas that is not the case. For instance, a molecule of water cannot boil and cannot freeze. I think that the reductionist is that one who is able to explain more complicated facts without addition of new law through basic laws of nature of physics. That's true. This is reductionist. And so, in this sense, you know, I believe that uh, it is a very good working tool. And I did not below, you know, it was fascinating how you illustrate all beautiful structures, your supramolecules, etc. But still, you will not find new law of nature, basic law of nature. In principle, it may be very complicated. And it is much more better, of course, to use your laws, laws of chemists or of biologists, and not going from the very basic laws of physics, because it's too long and to, to uh, cumbersome, but I believe that still uh, the very pragmatic point, or not pragmatic, but, but correct view of the world is that it can be reduced to basic laws of nature. After all, we are also part of nature, so also you like to speak of those who have stents or other artificial things as uh, not natural, yeah. so we invented them. And we were invented by yeah. nature. Uh, in fact, I... <laughs> I do agree with the fact that all the bricks 
But what the Gavin assembly of these bricks brings is something which is not in the brick itself. Well, so uh, <laughs> I would have another question. What do you think about Théâtre de Chardin? It's a completely different question. <laughs> because you seem to be so enchanted by the evolution, by the structure, which is more and more complicated. So he was, of course, much further away from nature, but still, it was an idea which many people followed. Uh, I, I think I am, in, in some respects, reductionist because I think everything is built up from given building blocks, but the given it's like also a painting. If you have colors, you can make any painting with the colors. So, but the, the final painting is something different from the colors. It's another level of... Sure. With this, I agree, but we go then over, I think, natural sciences. But it's the same with uh, molecules. With molecules, you can make many different things. Yeah. I had this discussion with Jean-Pierre Changeux also, <laughs> you know, with this question of uh, reductionism and uh, emergence. Most, m many scientists now are rather uh, speaking of emergence that new properties emerge. There are properties. It doesn't mean that the building blocks are different, but the properties are different as it gets more complex. Yeah. <laughs> so if... I, if <laughs> That's a... Uh, right? Je, Je, a Jean-Marie, if I'm not wrong, so you are talking about uh, something like additional value as being associated with more complex systems. Yeah, yeah, this is not, this is, yeah, okay. <laughs> Usually you, yeah, people say you, you have yeah. entropy increases. Yeah. But if this was, the, but it's not entropy which controls the world, it's free energy, delta G. Yeah. And delta G is entropy minus T delta S. So the reason why we exist is that delta G is stronger than T delta S. Yeah. Otherwise it would not exist. Take a hydrogen molecule, hydrogen molecule is H2. You take two atoms of hydrogen, from infinity, and you bring them together. This one has three degrees of uh, motion, of uh, translation. This one also, so six altogether. And if you make one molecule, you have only three degrees of translation. So you lose entropy, and the reason is that you make a bond. So the, the, the entropy compensa overcompensates the entropy. Okay. Otherwise, it would not exist. Yep. Okay, so... <laughs> Vino, okay. <laughs> Let me to end it, uh, uh, this discussion up now. And before I allow you to move to, uh, next, to the next room, so let me also to hand a small gift over to Professor ja Jean-Marie Lane. So we have a... Because... You, you should know, actually, Jean-Marie is a member, is a fellow of uh, the, the Learned Society of the Czech Republic and since a long time ago. Long so, time. And I am sure that he is still missing a, a special Learned Society tie. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, so next uh, time you I have to like put it, on a tie. Actually, you know, next time, next year. <laughs> when yeah. it's not so hot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Thank so. you. Thank you, thank, 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 you, you very much. thank you so much. And uh, also, let me, uh, Mrs. Uh, Attaché Veronica is already, is Veronica? she already left. Please call her Michal. <laughs> so, we have also a small gift for her, okay? Mrs. Attaché. Dear Veronica, uh -huh. <laughs> we do have a small, small gift for you too. So it's a scarf. She so does a I, lot of I'm work. I'm sure that you will <laughs> like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Voila, voila. Bravo, bravo, bravo. You know, I've... <laughs> so, once again, thank you so much for the opportunity to have you here. Yeah. Thank you very much. And please enjoy. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of our time.